Hello and welcome to Ocean Calls, a Euronews podcast series in which we plunge into the issues making waves on our blue planet. I'm science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. Sea level rise is going to be one of the factors which drives people out of their homes. We're now at a stage where we're putting the entire Earth system's stability and function at risk, and the ocean is, is what keeps it stable. The voices there of British environmentalist George Monbiot and renowned Swedish scientist Johan Rockström are two guests for this first episode of Ocean Calls. Today, I'll be asking them perhaps the biggest question of them all. Is it too late to save the ocean? In later episodes of this podcast series, we'll be dipping our toes into the controversial waters of deep sea mining, asking if it's okay to eat fish if you love the ocean, picking apart the problem of ocean plastic pollution, and asking who on earth is in charge of the high seas? You'll also hear from passionate people from the worlds of science, cinema, and even space about their favourite ocean species. And today it's extra special because the guest discussing their favourite marine animal is none other than Dr. Jane Goodall, one of the world's leading defenders of nature. First, I'd like to welcome Professor Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, the man whose explanation of planetary boundaries and how we're passing them has inspired so many minds. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Yeah, great, great to invite me. Looking forward to the discussion. And George Monbiot, environmental activist and author whose ideas and arguments have enthralled readers around the world. George, great to see you on our podcast. Hi, great to see you too. I know that, Johan, you're in Potsdam. George is somewhere in the UK. How often do you actually get out there in nature and plunge into the ocean? Well, my favourite activity is sea kayaking. That's, that's what I love above all. That's where I really sort of feel at peace. Unfortunately, in Oxford, which is right in the middle of England, there's not a great deal of scope for it. But the good news is we're moving to Devon this summer. So, uh, And part of the reason for that is that I can get out on the sea much more. I really love the sea and I miss it terribly here in the centre of England. I have water, the ocean, I think ingrained in my DNA to the extent that um, my wife and I moved out to an island in the Stockholm archipelago after having lived in Africa for more than 10 years. When I moved to Potsdam, it was just impossible to find, uh, you know, a place affordable close to water. So um, we are now living on a houseboat. It doesn't really compare to the, the high seas of the ocean, but um, it kind of calms down your, <laughs> your vibes. Yeah, I'm from Swansea in South Wales, where we have a pretty good tradition of attempting to go surfing or just mucking around in the cold water in the summertime, and I absolutely love it. Um, the question that we're asking here, um, which is in our first episode of this podcast series, is, is it too late to save the ocean? Johan, can you give us a kind of yes or no answer to that question? Well, if you force me, and you know academics hate yes and no type questions, but I I would argue that on balance, the evidence says that yes, we still can um, save the ocean. We are really putting all living systems on Earth to the brink of pressure, but it's showing a remarkable resilience and ability to to not only buffer and, uh, and, and kind of cope, but also to rise if we back off, basically, and, and become stewards of the systems. And we can come back to what, what the evidence is behind that. But my answer would be yes. And George? Well, if we say it's too late, it becomes too late. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It will be too late if we don't start engaging with this issue with the seriousness that it demands. We've got to take serious issues seriously. And we find ourselves instead facing this daily tsunami of trivia and nonsense, which we're asked to focus on. So, you know, one celebrity slaps another and it gets more coverage, I think, than all the climate coverage there'd been in the previous year. This is particularly the case when it comes to the oceans, which are sort of doubly, triply neglected. We neglect environmental issues in general. When we do apply ourselves to environmental issues, we tend to focus on terrestrial ones. When we do 
apply ourselves to marine issues, we tend to focus on the relatively smaller aspects of it rather than these huge existential crises which our oceans are facing from the fishing industry, from heating and from acidification in particular, uh, to which you could add the great flux of synthetic chemicals and organic materials pouring into the ocean as well. So yes, if we don't start talking about it, it will be too late. If we don't start acting on what we know, it will be too late. We know what we need to do. The technologies, the, the ways of doing things, they're already there. It's a question of whether we can summon the political will to challenge legacy industries, to change the way things are done, and to follow the science and actually protect ourselves and the living systems on which we depend. What would you say is the most pressing issue that we really have to deal with straight away? Because as you say, it's very broad. Well, I think, I mean, it's hard to prioritise because <laughs> they're all pretty scary, but I think the one I would put at the top of the list is industrial fishing because it does literally rip through marine ecosystems and it's almost universal. Even most of the so-called protected areas are protected from all sorts of things which aren't, aren't actually threatening them, but they're not protected from the thing which is threatening them most, which is industrial fishing. In fact, in European marine protected areas, there is more fishing than outside those areas. And there's nothing being done. In most cases, there's one or two places where it's stopped. How can any ecosystem in the long term survive such pressures? I'd like to build directly on, on, on George's answer, which I fully agree with. But I, I think we have to recognize that there is not just one focus that will be enough to save the life and the functions of the ocean. We have to address, I would argue, four uh, simultaneous and interacting crises and pressures on the ocean. And, and number one is definitely the industrial overfishing that we have 70, 80% of the oceans being overfished or even exploited to their limits already today. But secondly is the warming of the ocean. So far, we measure only temperature in the atmosphere, 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming since pre-industrial time. But 90% of all the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning is absorbed and hidden in the ocean. Fish marine life are not able to adapt to the rapidly warming temperatures. And then you have this enormous crisis that we so seldom talk about, which is acidification, that uh, you know the pH levels in the oceans have gone down by 30% because of the carbon dioxide uptake in the ocean. You also have the eutrophication in the ocean. So we're loading the oceans with reactive nitrogen and phosphorus, which is causing anoxic coastal zones, you know, and then on top of all this, as if that was not enough, you have the marine pollution. The fact that we very soon are coming to a point where we have more microplastics in the ocean than we have living mass of fish. Did you know that 97% of the Baltic Sea suffers from eutrophication, basically meaning it has too many nutrients in it. Now, nutrients sound like a good thing, but massive amounts of them aren't. Nitrogen and phosphorus feed algae that grow so fast that it blocks the light and air for everything else living in the water. Do you think that there are some risks related to climate change, such as ocean acidification, that we're kind of ignoring because we don't know what to do about it at all? We actually have no clue. Absolutely, and, uh, and we're ignoring it just as we have been ignoring for decades the fact that the only way to have a safe landing on climate is to be sustainable managers of the living biosphere not only in the ocean but also on land so yes we're we are well not totally neglecting certainly not in the scientific community policy wise we're definitely neglecting and just take ocean acidification i mean remember that ocean acidification is high school chemistry it is carbon dioxide plus water gives gives carbonic acid, exactly what you have in a Coca-Cola bottle. So it's very basic and it leads to pH decline. Now, that's the chemical disaster of our fossil fuel burning. And there's no other source than burning oil, coal, and natural gas. And it's ruining all marine life on Earth. I would argue that is enough to phase out fossil fuels. But we never use that argument and it's never been lifted into the political discussion in a proper way. George, what do you think about that? Do you think we're, again, ignoring some of these topics that we don't quite know how to handle? 
Well, in a way, it's worse than that, because there's a lot of people hoping to apply techno fixes so that you don't have to challenge the legacy industries. You don't have to take on oil and gas and coal. You don't have to upset anyone in a powerful position. You don't have to alienate the billionaire press, which determines whether you get elected or not. Here in the UK, for instance, you know, we had the UK hosting COP26, the Glasgow Climate Summit. Boris Johnson grandstanding on the stage, claiming to be James Bond. We have the technology. We have the banks. We're going to save you. You know, this whole white saviour thing, these grand statements before he flies off on a private jet down to London to have some dinner with some climate deniers. But immediately after that conference, which the UK hosted, it goes and licenses a new oil and gas field. And unfortunately, that is the default state of governments around the world. That is what the great majority of them are now doing. The big economies you know, are doing almost nothing. And so what's going to happen is that people say, well, it's all too difficult. You know, it's, it's too embedded. We're taking on too big an interest. You know, let, let's just go for the techno fixes. Let's just do some geoengineering. But that can only even if it works, even if it doesn't cause such disastrous side effects that we instantly decide we don't want to do it as soon as we've started it, it can only solve one small part of the problem. Yeah, I get press releases about this and I receive information about it and I have PRs phoning me up and telling me about their wonderful system to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and various blue carbon technologies. And then I ask the question, okay, so imagine we did that at scale. What happens to the climate system? And they don't seem to have an answer. I've asked some climate scientists. They don't seem to have an answer either. Do we know, Johan? Do we know what happens? I mean, one set of them are the ones that I would argue we should not venture into under any circumstances. And there are not, not quantitative risk analysis, but there's enough evidence that we take too large risks of unexpected secondary effect. And that is solar radiative management or stratospheric release of different aerosols to reflect back incoming solar radiation back to space. And the impact of that is that we don't get rid of carbon dioxide at all, so it just continues to ruin the ocean. But then there's another family of technologies which you were now referring to primarily, and that is carbon capture. The problem with them, I would argue today, is primarily that they don't exist, meaning that it's technologies at a small pilot scale. We're approaching tipping points. We are at risk of destabilizing permanently life support systems on Earth. So we have no choice. We have to start scaling carbon dioxide removal technologies, whether we like it or not. And the question is how to do it, rather. Yeah, but what's the effect of removing carbon dioxide on a massive scale? Will acidification and the sea level rise go down? So if you remove carbon dioxide, you will reduce acidification. Sea level rise is another story altogether because it's a slow process where we have already committed. When ice starts melting, you cannot turn it around rapidly. And and so it's a, there are different processes with different timelines. George, are you concerned about sea level rise? Or do you actually think it's something that we should come to later on and just focus on adaptation at that point? It's so hard to rank these issues. Um, There are billions of people who could be very seriously affected by sea level rise, either directly through having their homes flooded or trashed by storm surges, or less directly through, for instance, salt water intruding into the aquifers, which they depend on for drinking water and for irrigating crops. And it's really hard to see how a lot of communities are going to survive this. It's going to be one of the factors which drives people out of their homes. And huge numbers will be internally displaced. Some people might have to cross borders to escape from the impacts of that displacement and all the knock-on impacts which that will cause in terms of civil strife, hunger, the rest of it. When you think that that's just a subset of another crisis, which is climate breakdown, and you think, well, that's just a subset of a bigger crisis, which is Earth systems breakdown all of which is being driven by a massive level of economic activity and all the wildly unsustainable practices encapsulated in that. You have to give yourself a lot of time and brain space to get your head around what we're facing here. And most people just are not doing that. We prefer to immerse ourselves in distraction. 
Did you know that about 70% of sea level rise is due to ice melting on land and 30% is due to thermal expansion as the water gets warmer? Now, under all emission scenarios, sea levels will continue to rise by several millimetres per year for centuries to come. So we've had some kind of shocks, right? We had the storms in Europe last year that were kind of a wake-up call for some people. What is the kind of ocean shock that will create awareness? Because as you were saying, ocean issues kind of struggle to get attention. You know, I've been working all my working life on this since I was 22. I'm 59 now. And I've been trying to find the magic formula that wakes people up. I've tried to argue it every which way. I've used every possible medium, even music, for God's sake. Um, to try to reach people and to say, this time, maybe people will listen. And sometimes, yeah, you get a huge number of hits, your thing goes viral, but it still doesn't seem to change anything. I tend, unfortunately, <laughs> to land where George is. But this is good that you raised this question because it's a qualifier to your first question, actually, when we started, when you asked, can we still save the ocean? I said yes, but we will be losing significant richness, value, capital in the ocean. And those are already in front of our eyes right as we speak, irreversibly lost forever. We have the Arctic and the Arctic, you know, is melting so fast that very soon we'll have ice-free summers and, and destabilizing the weather systems in the Northern Hemisphere, which we're already seeing. So you refer to the floods, the devastating floods in Germany this summer. We had the, the killer heat wave in British Columbia. We had the 2018 heat wave in Europe with water scarcity and, and massive impacts on, on human health. Why is this happening? Well, it's scientifically shown that it's happening because the Arctic and Greenland is warming so fast. So, you know, it's not as if we're not hit. All of us are hit now and still we're not rising to these uh, devastating impacts. Okay, I really want to talk about fishing now. George, you heavily criticised the European Union in the past for their policies on management of fish stocks. They seem to think that they've done a reasonably good job in that area and that it's recovering. What's your view at the moment and what the EU is doing related to fishing? Well, just two days ago, the um, Marine Stewardship Council removed 14 fish populations from its um, Good Fish Guide recommended species. I mean, I find the whole good fish guide a bit weird. It's like, a bit like the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds having a good bird guide saying, um, yeah, it's okay to eat goldfinches because there's lots of them, but go easy on the kestrels. You know, it's like, why don't we see fish as wildlife? You know, just because they're underwater doesn't mean that all they are is seafood. But okay, that's, um, you know, it's a sign that actually things are going in the wrong direction. And I became very aware of this a few months ago when a trawler operator got hold of me. He runs a local boat which fishes uh, relatively inshore, like most of the local fleet there. But beyond the 12 mile limit, which is basically what he calls bandit country, you know, it's a free for all effectively. You've got these big French and Spanish boats coming in and they're gill netting. They'll set nets which are between 50 and 70 kilometres long. And you never see them unloading the old gill nets because these gill nets run out after a few months of use. And he and his colleagues are now pulling up more discarded gill nets than they're pulling up fish. And the thing which shocked me is that no one is doing anything about this. The Scottish government said, oh, well, this is very concerning and people should report it to the appropriate authorities. But when I checked, they had no data on it at all. And when a government has no data on something, it means it doesn't care. You know, ghost fishing should be the simplest thing to sort out. You know, you say, right, every net must be marked. So we know who takes it to sea. When it gets to the end of its life, it must be brought back and disposed of. And you've got a, a system for doing that. No, they can't even be bothered to sort that out. And they just let everyone throw everything overboard and use the sea as a giant dustbin. And if they're not sorting that out, what hope is there? for a rational management of marine ecosystems. What would be the number one recommendation if you were able to walk into the office of the European Commissioner for Fisheries today, then what would be the number one thing you'd say? Well, again, you know, it's kind of everything, but I would start by saying very large areas should simply be off limits to fishing because even the sort of most low impact fishing, like creel fishing, even that turns out 
to be devastating to some species, like um, around Britain, minke whales and humpback whales are being absolutely hammered by entanglements with the lines that connect the, the creels on the seafloor to the buoys on the ocean surface. And so you've just got to set aside very large areas, particularly the most sensitive areas, the migration routes, the rest of it, set those aside where you say there's no industrial fishing whatsoever in those places. And people are talking about 30% of the oceans, I would say potentially even more, particularly all the near coastal areas. There's been an almost complete collapse of monitoring and enforcement. And the mechanisms for monitoring and enforcement, which we retain, are absolutely useless. You know, you have observers put on certain vessels. The only vessels which allow the observers on are the ones which aren't doing anything wrong. And in some parts of the world where the vessels have to take observers, those observers have disappeared at sea. They've been murdered, in other words. And yet you could fix remote monitoring equipment on every boat every boat over five metres, you know, very cheaply and easily, much more cheaply than putting observers on. Yeah, there's this plan to put CCTV on them that's in the pipeline. And I think they've been talking about it for four years now or so. Yes, it's this remarkable new technology called CCTV, which has just come along. And now they're thinking, oh, you could actually put that on a fishing boat. Wouldn't that be radical? I mean, there's a whole series of things you can do. There's a package of remote electronic monitoring equipment, which could so easily and so cheaply be put on every vessel to show A, it's in the right area, B, it's not landing fish, it's not allowed to fish, C, is not dumping its nets overboard, you know, the whole load of things like that. They're not even doing that. Okay, well, we're going to wind things up now, and I want to end with a slight note of optimism, which I'm sure we can find because we started out with a bit of optimism. And I suppose this is a question, again, that you must get asked, I get asked, which is, what can we do as citizens to help with the management of the oceans? to help to save the oceans. Johan? I would say that the number one issue to do for every citizen is to follow the knowledge, follow the facts, um, you know, keep conversation going with your friends, have an active discussion, debate about the ocean and therefore the planet. Even if I'm sitting in Potsdam or in Stockholm, or if you're in London, or if you're in Burkina Faso, wherever you are, we're now at a stage where we're putting the entire Earth's system's stability and function at risk. And the ocean is what keeps it stable. That's number one. But then number two, of course, there are choices we have to make. And choices are, to a large extent, when it comes to the ocean, about what we eat and how we travel. And these are two very concrete issues that we can all act on in our everyday life to reduce the use of diesel and gasoline in the way we travel and to reduce and be very conscious of the choices of what kind of fish we eat, if we eat fish at all. So I think three changes of perspective, among many others, but the three I'd point to are, first of all, stop seeing fish as seafood, see them as wildlife, and part of really rich and fascinating ecosystems as connected and amazing as any terrestrial ecosystems are. Number two, stop seeing the ocean as some kind of planetary dustbin where all our sins can be dumped out of sight and out of mind. And number three, stop seeing yourself as a consumer and start seeing yourself as a citizen who is most effective when you get political, when you combine with other people to mobilise in the pursuit of demands, political demands. And top of the list of our political demands is the protection of Earth systems, of which, of course, the oceans are among the most crucial. George Monbiot and Johan Rockström, thank you very much for being with us on this podcast. Now, this is the part of the podcast we were going to call Favourite Fish because the original idea was to ask a well-known person with a passion for nature to talk about a species and why they love it the most. But what if they choose a sea otter or a whale or some kind of deep water coral? What if the animal they choose doesn't have gills and fins? So we are going to settle for calling it Ocean Favourites. In this first episode, you'll hear from a leading ethologist, the founder of the Jane Goodall Institutes in 26 countries and a United Nations Messenger of Peace. She's also the founder of the Roots and Shoots programme, empowering people of all ages to get involved in hands-on projects of their choosing to help people, animals and the environment. Many of you will be like me and remember seeing her on TV when you were a child. 
So let's hear all about Jane Goodall's ocean favourite. Well, I'm Jane Goodall and I'm known for studying chimpanzees, but I stopped doing that, left it to my research team a long time ago. Studying the chimpanzees was on the shore of Lake Tanganyika, which is not exactly the sea, but lots of water. And in Dar es Salaam, where also I have a home, there I spent a lot of time in the ocean snorkeling. Well, my absolute favorite, I mean, I've, it's hard to choose, but you know, the octopus, it's because they're so incredibly intelligent. Their brain is so completely different to ours. You know, in fact, they've got brains in each of their eight legs. Oh, there's so many stories. How can I convince you? One of my favorite is an octopus and she was in an aquarium. They couldn't understand why in the morning so often there was a fish gone from one of the tanks. So eventually they put up a camera as soon as everybody'd gone, Octavia would open the lid of her tank, crawl into another tank, devour a fish, close that lid, go back home and close her lid. They can solve puzzles which involve opening a door here and pressing a lever there and doing about six different things before they get to the reward inside. Also, what I love is this one octopus she had a particular dislike to a student who was studying her. And this was the only person she regularly, you know, they got a squirt tube. And the, the woman went away for three months and she came back and was immediately squirted. So they absolutely recognized faces. They have one central brain. And then they have, I can't remember how many brains in each of their arms, each of their eight arms. And for a while, if you cut an arm off, that arm can go on behaving in an intelligent way, avoiding danger and things like that. Well, I first encountered one when I was doing this snorkeling in the coral reef just outside Dar es Salaam. And she wasn't doing anything particularly special. She was just creeping along the ocean floor, and then she disappeared into her den. But it wasn't until I began reading about the intelligence of octopus, and then of course, I'm sure you've seen my octopus teacher. That kind of brought it to a head. And I don't know, I think the relationship was based on the octopus's curiosity. I mean, nobody had ever tried to make friends with an octopus before. I think it says a lot that you know, there's still, there's, none of the species are endangered and yet they're hunted and eaten all over the place by, by other sea creatures and by us. I mean, they're a delicacy in, in many parts of the world. The Ocean Calls podcast is created by ocean lovers here at Euronews for ocean fans around the world. I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes, and this series is produced by my colleagues Naira Davlashian and Natalia Olsner. Editing is by Laurie Martinez, Chiara Santella and Luis Lopez from Studio Ochenta. The theme music is by Gabriel Dalmasso. Our editor-in-chief is Sophie Claudet. For more from Jane Goodall, go to janegoodall.org. Follow Johan Rockström on Twitter on at jrockström and George Monbiot on Twitter on at George Monbiot. The podcast Ocean Calls is made possible by the European Commission's DG Mare. You can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, CastBox or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. And if you like the podcast, please give us a five-star rating, comment and tell your friends because your help makes spreading the word about the ocean so much easier. And if you want our team to read your comments on social media, use the hashtag Ocean Calls. If you're looking for something else to listen to, check out another Euronews podcast called Cry Like a Boy, exploring centuries-old gender stereotypes and how men in some African countries are helping to fight them. For more information on Ocean Calls, go to our website, euronews.com, and a special shout-out to Ocean, a Euronews TV series created by our colleague Denis Loctier, which is quite simply spellbinding. Have a look on euronews.com slash ocean. Follow world news from a European perspective on euronews.com. <laughs>